Zoom Zoom waits for no person, and I hope I don't have to say you're on mute. But the next um, the next presentation is from Ian Dunlop, who is a member of the Club of Rome, and he's, he's a member of the Australian Securities Lead, Australian Security Leaders Climate Group, and the Breakthrough National Centre for Climate Restoration. He was formerly an oil, gas and coal industry and he's seen the light, uh, executive and he's seen the light. He has wide experience in energy resources, infrastructure and international business. He chaired the Australian Coal Association in 1987 and 88, which was about when Professor Howden started telling us that climate change was real, and the development of the first Australian national emissions trading proposal in 1998 and 2000. Um, Ian Dunlop, I welcome you to the forum. Um, go ahead, please. Well, thank you very much, Charlie, and uh, much appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. I apologise for not being there in, in person. Um, I might just share my screen, if I may, if this is going to work. Okay. Can everybody see that all right? Hopefully. Yep, that's right. Okay, well... Um, Mark's uh, talked a fair bit, obviously, about the IPCC reports and the implications of those. I'd like to take the debate a bit further in terms of, well, OK, what are we going to do about it if you look at the real implications of risk, uncertainty, and where that leads to? Because we hear a great deal about the need now to make an orderly transition. But unfortunately, we've... Um, left ourselves very little time uh, in which to do that. So um, to begin with, I'll just take you back a little bit because as uh, Charlie mentioned, I am a member of the Club of Rome. And 50 years ago, uh, those of you of more advanced years will remember they put out a report called the Limits to Growth. Um, these were the key messages, and I won't go through all of this, but what it says is that if the present growth trends continue, the limits to growth on this planet are going to be reached sometime in the next 100 years. And the probable result of that will be a rather sudden and uncontrolled decline in both population and industrial capacity. It's possible to alter that outcome and to establish uh, sustainable conditions far into the future so that we can meet the needs of every person on Earth uh, with equal opportunity and so on. <clears throat> the third point was that if we decide to go for the second outcome rather than the first, the sooner we start working on it, the better. And finally, that as we approach limits, we will spend a great deal of time discussing it whilst expansion continues economically, which will lead to overshoot before collapse. That was 50 years ago. And um, if you look at the detail of this, this was the first time that computer modeling had ever been used to investigate the future of the world economy in a um, <clears throat> system called World 3, which was run at the MIT in the US. And the, that was 12 scenarios. And the what they call the standard run there uh, is shown in this picture. It's slightly complicated, but the dotted lines are the, the predicted trends in 1972. The solid lines are what has actually happened. And it's quite remarkable that uh, this standard run is actually very close to what has actually occurred. The problem, of course, is round about now, we start to get to a point of collapse <clears throat> where various limits are hit, and we cannot continue the economic system that we've been using to date. And you could <clears throat> argue that what we're seeing around the world at the present time is beginning to show the reality of that. Uh, what this was trying to do, and the overall aim of the study, was to look at the implications of exponential growth in both population and consumption within the finance system, and where would that lead us to? And the fundamental point, of course, is that the civilization as we have it only works if it grows economically. But that growth in turn is destroying the resources that uh, maintain the civilization. So the issue is really how are we going to resolve that dilemma? Well, 
if you um, look at climate specifically, uh, it wasn't in this study as such, but pollution is essentially a proxy for it, uh, which you can see as the dotted blue line there. And um, as you see, it's all sort of going up until around 2030, and then things start declining in a hurry. So um, I won't go into all of the other elements. You can see the food per capita uh, line there and where that's going to in terms of population. I think we'll, Stefan will touch on some of the implications of some of these boundaries um, or the modern version of them uh, later in the day. But I'd like to go on now and just look at what's actually happened on the climate front specifically. This is slightly complicated, but the dark blue line here shows emissions um, growing from 1970 up to the present day. You can see the temperature increase above it in terms of the uh, light blue line. And right at the top there, you see the change in atmospheric uh, and CO2 concentrations, uh, which is now up about uh, at 420 parts per million. And all of the various conferences that have taken place. So, you know, what you're really saying is that despite all of the meetings and all of the discussions and the, the great work that uh, organizations like the IPCC have done, nothing has really changed in terms of altering that economic model. The critical issues for climate, of course, are emissions. And just to give a slightly finer picture on that, that's CO2 concentrations that um, Mark touched on before, going back to 1960. No change, still going up despite the blips in COVID. If you look at methane of uh, great relevance to the agriculture industry, then, uh, you know, an even st steeper rise and some major concerns, in fact, about what's happening in some parts of the world on more natural uh, methane emissions increasing. So if you go back to the original Club of Rome argument, um, nobody acted. We're essentially still in discussion and we're heading for overshoot. So the problem, the real question is, is collapse inevitable? Are we going to be faced with uh, the type of picture that the original limits to growth outlined? Or do we have a way of actually heading that off? Now, <clears throat> I think John Schoenhoeber from the Potsdam Institute said a long time ago that political reality really must be grounded in physical reality or it's completely useless. And if you look at where we currently stand, our leaders and I think our institutions officially by and large remain a long way from that today. Uh, it's true globally, but it's particularly true still in this country. If you look at the, you know, the current Australian way climate policy, it's um, largely irrelevant in terms of uh, solving the problem we now faced with. So, the question then becomes, what is that reality? And um, what do we really have to do? Mark's given uh, one dimensions of that, but I'd like to focus on the, as I said, on the risk and uncertainty elements in, in particular. And this is primarily from a global point of view, but it's uh, directly relevant to, I think, what we do here in Australia. So just to uh, remind ourselves of where we're going, the Paris Agreement said we we're aiming to keep temperatures well below two degrees C above pre-industrial and pursue efforts to get as close to one and a half or say as close to one and a half as possible. If you look at the current debate nationally, um, there's a real lack of understanding of the difference between risk and uncertainty. Um, and risk in, the risks in fact of climate, let alone the uncertainty side of it, are barely mentioned in the national debate. It's all about you know, whether we can keep coal-fired power stations running, yes or no, when they have to slow down, uh, do we build more gas, et cetera. Nobody talks about the other side of the equation, what are the implications of actually not addressing the climate issue uh, seriously and taking the science seriously. So just to be clear on the distinction, I mean, risk, these are broad brush differentials, but risk is quantifiable. Um, you base it on historic experience, modeling, actuarial assessment, and so on. Um, in Donald Rumsfeld, Rumsfeld terms, you might say the known knowns um, within limits. 
Uncertainty is not. There's insufficient scientific or technical knowledge to identify what the um, uncertainty threats might be. Again, the known unknowns. We know things are out there, but we don't know exactly what the implications are going to be. And one of the big problems I think that we've had um, in recent time with our economic system is a tendency to want to transfer all uncertainties and quantify them and assume their risks. It happened in the global financial crisis. Um, uncertainty makes you think hard about your real future and the really important things in life. If you quantify it and stick it into a computer model, um, you get rid of moral value and it just becomes a straightforward economic calculation. And I think that's very relevant to what we're currently looking at in a climate context. So if you just take risk, at present, this diagram shows a range of computer models um, ranging from the, the three dotted black lines here, the top ones where emissions don't peak, the middle one where we have the Paris cuts, uh, plus some later action, and the lower dotted line, radical cuts. What this is telling us is that one and a half degrees C is pretty much inevitable now. Um, it'll be here by 2030, whatever we do in the meantime. Two degrees C, we may well hit by 2050 under high and central emission scenarios. And if we don't do anything fast, then three will be here about 2060 and five possibly before the end of the century. So that's the quantification, if you like, of um, recent science. And I think the, it's, it's um, very much backed up, I think, by the IPCC report. So what that means is that as I've said, one and a half before 2030, um, two by 2050, three, second, the early second half of the century, and five possibly by 2100. Even if we make substantial emission reductions um, in the immediate future, it's not going to have a significant impact on the warming trend of the next 20, 25 years because of the offsetting effect of aerosols in the atmosphere. These are the particles that come from uh, particularly uh, coal and oil burning, which are cooling the planet at present um, due to uh, <coughs> what might otherwise be the case. If you remove them, then you actually remove that cooling effect. So what we know is one and a half, 1.2 of the current warming is already dangerous. Two will be extremely dangerous. Three, catastrophic. And four will be unlivable for most people. We already hit 1.5, in fact, in 2019. So if you turn to uncertainties, there are a number of things that are not in, in detail in the IPCC report. So they started to come into uh, the working group one this year. And these are the tipping points because climate doesn't just move in a linear fashion um, necessarily related to cumulative carbon emissions but it may take a non-linear state at various points and jump from one relatively stable state to another. And these points, these areas were identified around the world some years ago now, and you can see them here. Um, there are ones that in the Arctic and West Antarctic, which we think uh, have probably already tipped in coral reefs, growing evidence that uh, others may be close to it and uh, changes occurring in, in other ones around the world. Now, the implication of that is that this is the whole called so-called hothouse earth scenario, um, where we don't know a lot about it, but we do know these are major risks and probably the biggest risks we face, because if that were to occur, we would have non-linear irreversible self-sustaining warming. And that could well be triggered by tipping points between 1.2 and 2 degrees C. And if the reaction time to prevent that tipping becomes longer than the intervention time left before it occurs, then we've lost control of the system. And there are concerns that we that may have happened already in some areas. So recent work, scientific work, if you look around the literature, suggests that West Antarctic, the Arctic, Greenland, the Amazon coral reefs may already have triggered or be close to it. Now, we don't know there uh, what that's going to happen, but if this were to occur and it, um, it begins to take off, 
then um, it becomes pretty much game over. So you really need to take a precautionary approach to this to ensure um, that irreversible tipping points don't become locked in. Because if they do, you know, there's nothing very much we're going to be able to do about it. Now, this is not discussed at all in the current debate in this country, and it's not really discussed globally. Um, but these are things that people have been worried about for a long time, and we need to start to face up to reality, not in an alarmist sense, but in the sense of saying, well, if we seriously want to manage this problem, then we better start to take into account of all of the, the, the knowledge we have. So the policy implications of all of this is that this whole idea of net zero by 2050 is totally inadequate. We've got to do it as soon as possible, uh, ideally by 2030. That really means a massive task, far greater than anything we're currently being told. Um, climate change is the greatest threat we face. It's not China. It's not the pandemic. Um, that threat is immediate because of the risks of the tipping points getting locked in. It's not years ahead. And we know that what we're facing today are the result of um, emissions in the atmosphere uh, from years ago. It, uh, you know, there's an inertia in the system. So we can't avoid the impacts becoming somewhat worse. What we've got to do is to make, make sure they, they don't even take off even further. Now, another element that's not talked about is we've got to reduce atmospheric carbon from what's about 420 parts per million CO2 now, or around 500 if you add in methane and so on, to a more stable 350. And the technology to do that is still in its infancy, which means we've got an even greater risk. And then finally, we may have to resort to the last thing that people have wanted, which is some elements of geoengineering to cool parts of the planet before other uh, initiatives we take really have effect. So the action that's now needed and um, is I just summarized here is that we've got to recognize this is our biggest threat. It's got to be made the highest priority and we're a long way from that right now. We've got to take the best knowledge we have and use it, not just ignore it. It's not just another item on the political agenda. It's a genuine existential threat to our future. So the actions that are needed, we've got to assess those risks with brutal honesty, accept that what we're going to have to do, not in an alarmist context, but just realistically, is an emergency mobilization um, akin to wartime. We have to achieve the maximum extent of change we can by 2030. And as Mark has said, it's not just net zero. We've got to go below that. But getting to net zero by 2030 will be hard enough. That means you really cannot afford any fossil fuel expansion. There is no point in pretending that we continue to build gas-led recoveries. Um, it's completely ignoring the realities of climate. And you've got to build that capacity to draw down carbon and then look at uh, what you can do and if you really have to use geoengineering. So we have the solutions and the, the technology and the solutions, they do offer increasingly great benefits. But we really have to stop this pretense, um, you know, that we've got it all under control and uh, you can do it with sort of techno-optimistic future scenarios that... Um, really have no end point to them. And we've got to move fast. So just a few aspects, I won't brought, you know, go into fast amounts on this, but aspects of mobilization you've got to, mobilization you've got to accept. Um, that this is our greatest security threat um, to an, in a national security sense, but not just in narrow militaristic terms, but in terms of human security. You've got to assess the risks and uncertainties properly, and we have never, ever done that in Australia yet. We have yet to do a proper risk assessment, which in 2022, with all the knowledge we have, is totally astonishing. We've got to recognise that an orderly transition is not possible. We already, before the uh, Ukraine conflict, were seeing major disruption in Europe with uh, energy prices and so on. And I would argue that's part of the beginnings of the disruption that the limits to growth uh, was talking about. So we're going to have discontinuities and we need to be able to be flexible to react to those um, extremely quickly. 
Um, one of the problems of all of this is you start to see these things become not just isolated events, but cascading compound events, um, which you, you know, you have one event, it leads to a series of others occurring, and you have all sorts of second order effects. And you can start to see it in the floods and the fires here in the sense that um, we're barely recovering from one disaster before another one happens. So you've still got people sleeping in tents after the bushfires, and now you have all these floods occurring. And they occurred last year, and they've occurred again this year. That's at the micro level. But in a macro level, you see the same thing possibly around the globe in terms of climate events themselves. It's going to require systemic change across society. It's not just incremental tweaking of the status quo, which is what we, the terms we tend to talk about in the media and so on. And a fundamental reform to the economic system, particularly the role of the state in handling this, because you can't just leave this to the market. The market's created the problem. It can't solve it, as is patently obvious by now. So the, the state has a, a, a very different role from the one that we currently see it. And beyond that, you also have major issues of inequality, which if you're going to solve this problem, are going to have to be addressed as well. And so finally, the precautionary action, you really have to start saying, well, what's the worst thing could feasibly happen? And how do we manage that if it were to occur? And then finally, leadership. Uh, probably the greatest thing that's missing in, in the current equation in this country is real leadership that is prepared to face up to the problem. Um, we had examples back in 2008 in the global financial crisis when the clean queen asked, well, why did nobody see the severity of this? And after a year, I think there was a response. So the psychology, psychology of denial gripped the financial and corporate worlds. The failure of the collective imagination of many bright people to understand the risks to the system as a whole. That is exactly what is happening with climate uh, globally and indeed in Australia particularly. And finally then, there were concerns some time back about the fact that people at high leadership levels had lost the ability to contemplate the real threats that we now faced because we've got so locked up in an economic system that have produced um, a comfortable life, if you like, since the Second World War. Um, and I think that still remains. Who is prepared to really take the actions we need in the face of these sort of challenges? So um, I'll just more or less skip this one because Mark's already touched on it into some of the agricultural implications of um, where we're going. Uh, this is a 2050 picture from the Chatham House uh, Royal uh, <coughs> Institute of Ro International Affairs in London, which did a major risk assessment study last year mm -hmm. on the extent of uh, all sorts of things, but particularly um, food security. And finally then, um, just to really understand where we're at, as Sir David King, the former UK chief scientist has said, we're about 500 parts per million CO2 at the moment. We've passed the tipping points in Arctic and Greenland systems. Um, we don't have any carbon budget left. So all the idea of more fossil fuels burning and so on, we shouldn't be putting any into the atmosphere anymore. So in his view, what we do in the next three or five years is going to determine the future of humanity. Now, people can say, well, that's an alarmist message. The fact is we've got to face up to reality and start to act because we do have the solutions, um, but they've got to be put together in such a way that we generate synergy where they all start working together and we get on top of this problem. But the starting point's got to be an honest acceptance of the position we're in. So I think I'll leave it there and um, hope that's a useful bit of backdrop to where we're now going to have to go to. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, thank you very much, Ian. Um, some of your slides were a little bit delayed coming up, but everybody saw them eventually. So really appreciate your uh, presentation. Unfortunately, we're not going to have time for questions.
Uh, we're running a little bit over time. <laughs> but you're very welcome to get onto Zoom. You can see there's 67 or something people there, 72 now. So get onto Zoom and ask Ian as many questions as you would like. Thank you very much, Ian, for your presentation. We are running a little bit over time, so I'm, I'm going to um, pursue the agenda. But I can just say one thing. Don't wait for politicians to lead you. Make it impossible for them not to follow you. That is how you create leadership. Um, 